In the developed world where people like to talk about democracy and freedom, France appears to be a leader. It likes to be called the protector of human rights, being a country of people with a rich history and culture. Paris, the Eiffel Tower, and the Palace of Versailles stand tall in France, among thousands of others. But what if we say everything you see in France, from its economy and development to prosperity, is due to Africa? Yes, African countries develop France and other European countries, and this is still going on. Despite being rich in precious resources, African countries have been doomed to poverty, while France milks out these resources. It has been exploiting African countries for centuries, and this continues to this day. The reason you are not told about this is that the horrors of exploitation have been brilliantly removed from history books. The media is paid to hide these things. The irony is that France offers financial aid to African countries, which means it first robs these countries and offers a fraction to show how generous it is. Watch this video to learn how France has injected poverty in Guinea, Haiti, and various other African countries. Let's get started. Behind the glamorous facade of France's rich history lies a darker tale of colonial exploitation and the enduring scars of French imperialism. France played a significant role in the economic devastation of numerous African countries, including Haiti, by implementing policies that ensured these nations remained dependent on France while exploiting their valuable resources. Today, France appears as a God-fearing country, making policies of utmost importance for human rights. It appears as the most sophisticated and delicate country on the planet because it thinks it can hide the horrors it commits under this cover. Once known as Saint-Domingue, the former French colony of Haiti stands as a stark example of French cruelty. The colony thrived on the brutal enslavement of Africans who labored on plantations, enriching France at the cost of countless lives. In 1791, the Haitian people rose against their oppressors and eventually secured their independence in 1804. It became the one of its kind and biggest successful rebellion against France's control and slavery in the Western Hemisphere. During the 18th century, Haiti stood as France's wealthiest overseas colony. Its prosperity stemmed from the cultivation of cash crops such as sugar, coffee, indigo, and cotton, all produced through the labor of black people. As of 1789, Saint-Domingue's population comprised five distinct interest groups. White planters who owned both plantations and slaves constituted one group, while Petit Blanc, including artisans, shopkeepers, and teachers, represented another. These Petit Blancs, some of whom owned a few slaves, also sought independence from France, mainly due to steep tariffs imposed on imported goods and trade restrictions. Nonetheless, the white population of Saint-Domingue, both planters and Petit Blancs, maintained their commitment to the institution of slavery. The remaining three groups consisted of individuals of African descent, free blacks, enslaved people, and Maroons who had escaped captivity. In 1789, there were approximately 30,000 free black individuals, half of whom were mulatto and often wealthier than the Petit Blancs. The enslaved population numbered close to 500,000, and the Maroons living in the mountains sustained themselves through subsistence farming. Haiti had a history of slave uprisings, with enslaved people demonstrating their unwillingness to accept their subjugated status through numerous rebellions and even poisoning plots against their masters. Inspired by events in France, Haitian-born revolutionary movements emerged, drawing inspiration from the French Revolution's Declaration of the Rights of Man. In response, the General Assembly in Paris granted some local autonomy to the colonies. However, this legislation, which called for all local proprietors to be active citizens, created ambiguity and triggered a civil war among the planters, free blacks, and petit blancs. This law allowed free citizens of color who owned substantial property to participate, but excluded Petit Blancs from governance. While these factions clashed, the enslaved black majority, influenced by the events in France, was also gearing up for action. Under the leadership of former slave Toussaint Louverture, they initiated the rebellion on August 21, 1791. By 1792, they controlled a significant portion of the island. Despite French reinforcements and escalating violence on both sides, the rebels continued to expand their territory. The conflict resulted in the deaths of 100,000 blacks and 24,000 whites, but the former slaves managed to resist both French and British forces, and eventually withdrew in 1798 after defeats by Louverture's forces. In 1801, 
L'Ouverture extended the revolution to neighboring Spanish Santo Domingo, today's Dominican Republic, abolished slavery there, and declared himself governor general over the entire island of Hispaniola. Haitian rule of Santo Domingo endured until 1844. By 1802, the Haitian Revolution had outlasted the French Revolution that had inspired it. Napoleon Bonaparte, now France's ruler, dispatched General Charles Leclerc, his brother-in-law, with 43,000 French troops to capture Louverture, reinstate French rule, and re-establish slavery. Louverture was captured and sent to France, where he died in prison in 1803. Jean-Jacques Dessalines, one of Louverture's generals and a former slave, led the revolutionaries to victory at the Battle of Vertier on November 18, 1803, defeating the French forces. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. On January 1, 1804, Dessalines proclaimed the nation's independence and renamed it Haiti. France became the first country to recognize Haiti's independence. Thus, Haiti emerged as the world's first black republic and the second nation in the Western Hemisphere to achieve independence from a European power. However, this freedom was not that easy. It came with a catch. France, unwilling to lose its prized colony, hatched plans to reclaim it. In 1806, Haiti was divided into two regions, with Alexander Petion ruling the South and Henri Christophe, a former black slave, in the North. Despite both rulers being veterans of the Haitian Revolution, France's ambitions to reintroduce slavery persisted. France devised a plan that if Haiti had gotten out of its hands, it would make it paralyzed, so ultimately, both parts of Haiti sought help from France. In other words, this would allow France to interfere in Haiti's matters and continue exploiting its resources. But something different happened. In 1814, King Louis XIII, who had aided in Napoleon's overthrow, dispatched three commissioners to Haiti to assess the willingness of the country's rulers to surrender. Christophe remained resolute, while Petion was open to negotiation in the hope of securing Haiti's independence recognition in exchange for payment. Drawing inspiration from the U.S.-Louisiana Purchase, Petion proposed paying France an amount similar to what the U.S. had paid. However, Louis XIV rejected the offer, viewing the Haitians as runaway slaves. The negotiations remained stagnant, with Christophe's defiance further complicating matters. After Christophe died in 1820, Jean-Pierre Boyer reunified the country. Yet despite Christophe's absence, Boyer struggled to secure France's recognition of Haiti's independence. It wasn't until April 17, 1825, that the French king abruptly changed his stance. France agreed to recognize Haitian independence but demanded an exorbitant sum of 150 million francs, roughly 10 times the amount the U.S. had paid for the Louisiana Territory. This colossal sum was meant to compensate French colonists for their lost revenues from slavery. Just try to imagine the moral standards of France at that time. It had gotten payment because it thought it had faced losses as slavery had ended in Haiti. Otherwise, if this had not happened, it would have continued slavery, adding to its treasury at the cost of black people's sweat and blood. Haiti had two options, either pay the payment or go to war with France. Baron de Macau, dispatched by King Charles the Gant as Louis's successor, arrived in Haiti in July accompanied by a squadron of 14 warships armed with over 500 cannons. This was done to intimidate Boyer and to give a message that French forces were ready to take Haiti back if payment was not made. With the looming threat of violence on July 11, 1825, Boyer reluctantly signed the document, which defined that the current inhabitants of the French part of Saint-Domingue must pay the exorbitant sum of 150 million francs as compensation to the former colonists. Accepting this payment was a dishonor for France, but sadly France was standing too low to realize how shameful it was for it. Newspaper articles from that era revealed that the French king was well aware that the Haitian government was hardly capable of making such payments. It's because this sum exceeded Haiti's annual budget by more than tenfold. Forced to borrow 30 million francs from French banks to make the initial two payments, it came as no surprise when Haiti defaulted shortly thereafter. Despite this, the new French king launched another expedition in 1838, deploying 12 warships to coerce the Haitian president into compliance. The 1838 revision, known as the Traite d'Amitié, or Treaty of Friendship, reduced the outstanding debt to 60 million francs. However, the Haitian government was once again instructed to take out crushing loans to settle the remaining balance. Do you see how carefully France was playing? 
it was forcing Haiti to make the payment by taking loans from its own bank. This way, Haiti was being used as collateral, and failing to make payments to the French bank meant a clear road for France to take Haiti back. Although the colonists claimed that the indemnity would cover only one-twelfth of the value of their lost properties, including the people they had enslaved, the total sum of 90 million francs was in fact five times France's annual budget. The Haitian people bore the brunt of the consequences of France's theft. Boyer imposed draconian taxes to repay the loans, and projects such as developing a national school system, which had been underway during Christophe's reign, had to be put on hold. Furthermore, researchers have found that the debt resulting from Haiti's independence, along with the drain on the Haitian treasury, directly led to the underfunding of education in 20th century Haiti, a lack of access to health care, and the country's inability to develop public infrastructure. Contemporary assessments have also revealed that, with the interest from all the loans, which were not completely paid off until 1947, Haitians ended up paying more than twice the value of the colonists' claims. The impact of France's actions on Haiti's stability and wealth cannot be underestimated. This demand for repayment not only perpetuated the cycle of poverty, but also symbolized the theft of wealth from Haiti. In contrast to the poverty rates in metropolitan France, where 14.6% of the population lives below the poverty line, Haiti suffers from a dire situation with an astonishing poverty rate of 59%. These extreme economic disparities illustrate the enduring consequences of a history marked by exploitation and economic injustice. Even if France's plan to get Haiti back did not work, it succeeded in paralyzing it. From 1791 to today, Haiti has failed to get out of poverty because, in the very years of its independence, it was made to compromise on its development, future, and education. To understand what evil France did to Haiti, know that the median annual income for a French family exceeds $31,000, a contrast to the meager dollar four hundred fifty dollars for a Haitian family. These glaring disparities in wealth and income underscore the persistent consequences of stolen labor from generations of Africans and their descendants. The French indemnity forcibly imposed on Haiti exacerbated the nation's economic struggles, making it even more challenging for Haiti to break free from the cycle of poverty. This burden, demanding compensation from formerly enslaved people to those who had once enslaved them, is an unparalleled situation in history and further deepens Haiti's economic woes. Then comes the sabotage of Guinea. In 1958, when Sekoutour of Guinea made the historic decision to break away from the French colonial empire and declare the country's independence, it triggered an intense reaction from the French colonial elite in Paris. Their outrage led to a shocking and unprecedented act of destruction in Guinea. The French administration in Guinea, in an act of rage, dismantled and destroyed everything they believed represented the benefits of French colonization. 3,000 French citizens left the country, taking all they could with them and leaving behind a trail of destruction. Schools, nurseries, public administration buildings, cars, books, medical research institutes, instruments, tractors, horses, cows on farms, all were subjected to deliberate destruction or sabotage. The French government had vowed to destroy Guinea, it was because it had committed the worst crime, as the French viewed it, by demanding independence. Perhaps France thought that it was doing God's job by colonizing African countries and developing them. That's the mentality that exists today. Whenever you ask someone with racial leanings about slavery and exploitation done by colonizers, they would say that colonizers developed African countries as well. That's the worst and dumb argument one can present. African countries were developed using their own resources, it was not the colonizers' favor in African countries. Food and warehouses were either burned or poisoned. This outrageous act was intended to send a clear message to all other colonies thinking about independence. Rejecting France would come with severe consequences. This act of destruction created fear among the African elite. And following the events in Guinea, no other colony found the courage to follow Sekoutour's example, whose slogan had been, we prefer freedom and poverty to opulence and slavery. In 1960, when Guinea decided to issue its own national currency, France organized a sabotage operation known as Operation Persil to destabilize the newly independent country. The operation had two main objectives, causing economic collapse and inciting armed insurgencies against the Guinean government. The operation involved creating large quantities of counterfeit Guinean francs to flood the country, leading to hyperinflation and economic collapse. This economic instability was intended to weaken Guinea's government. Additionally, France planned to arm opposition figures in Guinea 
and organized them into paramilitary groups, aiming for civil unrest and the eventual overthrow of Touré's government. However, due to leaks, the Guinean government managed to uncover and thwart the operation before it could be executed. When the destabilization of former colonies didn't yield the desired results, France resorted to other means to maintain control over its colonies and continue profiting from their resources. Since 1961, France has maintained control over the national reserves of 14 African countries, all of which were former colonies. These countries include Benin, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, Ivory Coast, Mali, Niger, Senegal, Togo, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Congo Brazzaville, Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon. The currency used in these countries is the CFA franc, which was created in December 1945 and initially became the currency for the French colonies in Africa. The French treasury guaranteed this currency under a fixed exchange rate, but required that these African nations deposit 50% of their CFA franc reserves into the French central bank. This arrangement effectively gave France control over these countries' resources. Even if it was African countries' money, they could not withdraw and use it for development or to end poverty. That's how filthy and exploitative France is to this day. The CFA franc was later divided into two financial communities, the Community Financière d'Afrique, CFA for West African countries, and the Communauté Financière de l'Afrique Centrale, CFA Central for Central African countries. France's control over these countries' currency and reserves has been a source of economic dominance and controversy, perpetuating a system where these nations have limited control over their own financial resources. African countries have repeatedly strived to free themselves from French control, but more often than not, African revolutionaries and former French colonies have faced violent resistance from the French government. The death of Barthélemy Boganda serves as a poignant example of this. Boganda served as the president of the Central African Republic from December 1958 to March 1959. During his brief time in power, he made significant moves to sever the ties between the Central African Republic and France. He founded the Movement for the Social Evolution of Black Africa, a political party committed to liberating not only the Central African Republic but also the French Congo and other African colonies from French rule. Boganda played a vital role in his country's quest for independence and planned to extend his efforts to liberate other African territories under French rule. However, France reacted strongly to the growing independence movement in the Central African Republic. Boganda was arrested during his 1951 campaign for endangering the peace, although he was released shortly thereafter. Tragically, he met his demise in a plane crash in March 1959. You can understand how that would have happened. Any time a leader wants to get away from West's control, either he dies in an accident or is killed by his own people. Muammar Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein are examples. The French General Secretariat of Civil Aviation investigated the crash but never made their report public. The French newspaper Le Express leaked parts of the report that indicated traces of explosives were found in the wreckage of Boganda's plane. In response, the French High Commissioner suppressed all copies of Le Express printed in the Central African Republic. It is essential to bring these issues to light and raise awareness of the harm caused by France's actions. The CFA franc, for instance, limits the economic choices of African countries and keeps them reliant on France, hindering their ability to address critical social and developmental needs and trapping them in poverty. France's control over African countries' reserves prevents them from utilizing their own resources to better their societies, making them among the poorest nations in Africa. This control perpetuates economic dependence and obstructs these nations from making independent decisions about their futures. For Africa to develop on its own terms, it must break free from France's view of the continent as a mere tool for enriching and advancing French interests on the global stage. Do you think France will be able to keep the facade intact that it's a so-called democratic and kind country? Or have people started to see how it has been exploiting Africa? Let us know. Would you see France with the same eye you saw earlier? Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about. The black culture, civilization, history, and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.